pushing forward, particularly with our plenary around COVID vaccine distribution. Um, but before we start with the plenary, um, we're going to be hearing from Students for Global Health National Director Chaitra Dinesh. Um, Chaitra is going to be speaking about what Students for Global Health do as an organisation and, and point you towards any opportunities that are available. Um, and then we'll be handing over to Arisma, who's one of our speaker liaisons for the conference, and she'll be chairing our second plenary, as I mentioned. So the plenary title is Hashtag No COVID Monopolies. How can we have equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution? A much needed question. Finally, we'll be hearing from our campaign lead, Rachel, um, and she'll be giving us a brief introduction to our hashtag Where's the Vaccine campaign. Hopefully you've all seen it on our social media already and got excited about it. So I'll be giving you a bit of a taster ahead of um, the campaign training session, which we have tomorrow. So that's enough from me. Um, I'm very happy to now hand over to Chaitra to talk about SFGH National. Thank you, Aisha and Rebecca. Um, first of all, I just want everyone to use the reaction emojis, if possible, to give a big hand to the organizing committee. Uh, big hand, I don't know, celebration, whatever you want to use, anything. Um, it's, so I know that there's a few of the organizing committee here, Aisha, Rebecca, Rishma, who's doing today's so AXA. So well done for um, all the amazing work that you guys have been doing. It's been wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed this morning's plenary. Um, couldn't attend all the workshops because at the same time as the conference and all the topics that we've been having and learning about, there's been our National uh, General Assembly as well. For those who might not know what a General Assembly is, this is where we wrote in the uh, what, new committee. We also wrote in policy statements that we want to pursue and we want to work on. We in our many, many governance things, um, uh, which I won't bore you with, but um, all very exciting and very useful for our uh, for us as an organization. So that's what we've been doing uh, alongside the conference. So we've just uh, passed through the coordinated theme for the upcoming year, which is going to be race and health. Um, so this is going to be a theme that most of our advocacy efforts will be focused on in the next year. This year, it was climate change and health. Um, and for that, there are still many, many activities happening. Um, I will be posting a link about something that you can get involved with in that very soon. Um, other things that, so um, that's what's been happening so far, but just to give you guys a little bit of an information about what Students for Global Health is, if this is the first time you are coming across us. Um, so we are a national charity, registered charity in the UK, who have the vision of a fair and just world in which equity in health is a reality for all. And so we work on various issues that focus on health equity, health justice. Um, and as you can imagine, this, these are cross-cutting, so we can work on as many things as possible and we can, we can make everything relevant to this. Um, so we do work on a variety of issues. So if there's anything you're particularly interested in in this field, um, we might already be working on it. So get in touch. If not, we will uh, really encourage you to help work on this. Um, so Cambridge, uh, who are a branch of us today, um, have passed through a national working group on antimicrobial resistance. And so we will be working on that as a national entity from now on. So um, within our national so structure, we have various committee members who are all volunteers helping us uh, provide all the work that we do. There's uh, 25 of us. Not all of us are here. Um, it's very difficult to get all 25 in one place. There's a few people here who you can see. Um, I'm going to quickly let them wave and do, uh, do a quick hello. Um, so we work mainly in four sort of areas um, within the team. There is the logistics, which is uh, maybe the, the more boring side, but it's it's like the, the, the thing that keeps us ticking. So uh, there's me in that, uh, there's the uh, secretary, our finance treasurer, um, our communications directors, um, and also um, our alumni director a coordinator, etc., who all do lots of work to keep our, our charity ticking. We have our branches team. Um, so many of you who are from different branches will know about uh, the branches team. They are the ones who coordinate all activities that happen down. So all the regional coordinators um, and also our 
Director Branch Affairs who is Ollie. Hello Ollie. Um, and hello Maria, who is our SNI South uh, Scotland Scot uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland <laughs> Regional Coordinator. Um, there's so many of us. Then we have our international work that we do. So this is we are the so the UK Medical Student Representative on the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, and we also partner with other international organisations. So our international team really works on that. So there's Anu, who is our Director of International Affairs, um, Karishma, who is our National Office on Research Exchanges, um, Anna, who is also one of the other National Offices on Research Exchange, Salma, who is our National Officer on Professional Exchanges. Um, so working on global health research as well as uh, medical placements, medical electives abroad. Then we have our content team who do the major of the work. So, uh, okay, everyone does lots of work. Let's not say that, but uh, they do lots of work. Uh, any content pieces that you will see, any help for us to really provide with that is done by the content team. So the content team has our policy and advocacy director, Rhiannon. Um, so anything to do with policy and advocacy, reactive advocacy. If you see something you want us to advocate on and we are not, I'm not saying anything about it, please contact us on our social media and just messages like, oh, why are you not talking about this? please talk about it um, and also email Ariane if you want us to do anything. Um, and we have our global health education director who is focused on talking about global health education and getting that into university level. And also now we are expanding into trying to get that into secondary schools. And that's being done by Maureen, who is our global health education in schools coordinator. Hi, Maureen. Um, so uh, if you did want to get some global health education in your local secondary schools and you have a branch who's interested in that, especially if you have like a sex expression branch and are aware of um, how uh, we work with secondary schools, then please do get in touch with her. Right. So, um, and then within the content team, we also have Antonis, who's our training director. So capacity building. So all of us are students. Um, many of us are students um, and many of us also like learning and capacity building. So uh, the way that we do that is through these training sessions that Antonis helped run. Um, so I believe I've covered everyone. If not, um, forgive me national committee uh, there are other people as well in behind the scenes but i can't cover everyone what i would ask uh, from those who are here is if you if possible please um follow us on social media and all um so that you are kept up to date with all the various activities that we do across the board they're far too much to explain in 10 minutes um we can only do them if we have active participation from our branches and our members uh, because main, everything that we do is to do with collective action and advocacy so we don't have anyone helping us out we can't really advocate for anything uh, so do uh, do follow us and do spread the message um, I'd also like to put a spotlight on the Health for a Green New Deal campaign that we are doing with a few other organizations um, I will give a, a, a minute opportunity to Rhiannon to give a little bit of a plug about what this is, if that's okay. Um, and there's a link to join that in the in the uh, chat. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I don't want to steal too much access to Medicine's Thunder, um, which is obviously a super important issue. Um, and but at the moment, we are co-leading nationally a campaign called Health for a Green New Deal, which is about getting the health community to support a just transition to a sustainable, um, equitable and healthy future um, in the UK and globally. Um, so it's a super exciting opportunity to develop your organising and advocacy skills and get involved with a really exciting up and coming campaign. And yeah, so super cool. And the link to get involved is in the chat. So look out at your branch level and at the national level. Um, but yeah, otherwise do your access to medicines advocacy as well, because we love it. It's all part of the same thing. <laughs> exactly, because global health is a local issue and anything that you work on on a local level will affect us well, worldwide. Um, and so thank you for listening so far. I just want to end with saying that there's 
uh, although um, elections are happening this weekend, there are a few positions that have not been applied for. So if anybody, anyone from here is interested, if you're uh, interested in applying for a national committee position, please do um, look out for the post Spring General Assembly application forms that will be going out. Um, secondly, if any of you are uh, encouraged and very impressed by the uh, conference that's being organized by SFGH KCL and UAEM KCL um, and UAEM UK, please do think about applying for to host uh, a conference in the upcoming term. Uh, we have three conferences up for grabs. One will be uh, in the autumn period, another one in the February spring period, and also one around this time next year um, and if you would like to apply um, to host a conference please do get in touch with the regional coordinators and email Oliver on branches um, and do apply for that um, if you have any questions about national committee positions get in touch with us messages um, on social media we will be very happy to explain um, and get you on board all you need is motivation uh, as I've said before um, uh, and uh, we are a very nice family who do joke around with each other. So trying to sell us here now. <laughs> um, hopefully everyone else agrees. No one thinks that I'm being a dictator in the uh, in the national committee. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Aisha and Rebecca, for giving me the opportunity to talk now. I'll let uh, you and uh, Arishma now introduce the uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Chetra. Uh, that was a really nice introduction to SFGH, and I'm sure a lot of us in the call today will be getting involved with SFGH. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to our last plenary for today. Hashtag no COVID monopolies. How can we have equitable COVID vaccine distribution? I'm Arisma, a first year medical student at King's and one of the speaker liaisons for this conference. And I will be facilitating today's discussion and plenary. So just a quick introduction to today's plenary. Resource-rich countries have administered at least one vaccine dose to more than a quarter of their population, while countries like South Africa and Thailand have vaccinated less than 1%. With acronyms and jargon such as COVAX, TRIPS, waivers, and patent pools, exploring the world of COVID-19 vaccine distribution and access is confusing. But this plenary is here to save you, and it's designed to introduce you to all these concepts in an informative and engaging way, and we truly hope you enjoy. So just before we begin with our speeches, I'd like to reiterate some housekeeping rules. So please stay muted while our speakers are talking. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and our speakers will answer them at the end when we have our live Q&A session. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of today, Professor Graham Dutfield. So Professor Dutfield is a professor of international governance at the School of Law in the University of Leeds, and he has advised governments across the world, including Brazil, Ghana, and Zambia. He has been referred to as one of the world's leading experts on issues of traditional knowledge and intellectual property law. And we are so grateful to have you here with us today. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, okay, so what I want to do is to talk about the pharmaceutical industry as a business and see how that relates to the current debates on COVID. Let me just first just say, I feel like as an old guy, uh, it feels to me like the, the present and future of global health advocacy is in very good hands uh, with, with your group, your network. So, uh, so respect for that, you know. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about one, the industry's motivations. That's quite easy to deal with. Uh, the second, about where its money comes from, which is not quite so, uh, so uh, simple. Uh, and third, how it is able to exclude price-reducing competition for as long as possible. And this is not just about patents, as I'll explain. Right. So first, motivations, the easy part, okay, is to, to maximise profits, obviously, uh, we talk, they talk a lot about shareholder value maximization, right? Shareholder value maximization. Uh, so this is sort of what you might call shareholder capitalism. Uh, and this, of course, does affect pricing strategy. And also the therapeutic areas industry wants to spend it, its money on. Um, so, you know, industry uh, likes sort of 
those uh, therapeutic areas where you need to keep on taking a drug until you die, you know, uh, in hope that you will live a long time so that you'll keep on taking this medicine. And so, so ka-ching uh, year after year after year. Uh, second is, you know, cures. Um, uh, um, cures, well, why, why are cures not necessarily desirable? Because once you're cured, you don't need it anymore. Um, and third is prevention. Uh, prevention is not necessarily that interesting. Historically, vaccines haven't been the main products of industry. Of course, now um, that issue is under the spotlight because, of course, uh, massive support uh, from government's taxpayers' money is going in, uh, and that changes the, changes the picture quite a lot. Okay, so industry will say, so on to about the money, right? Uh, industry will say that research and development is, uh, is funded by sales revenues from the early generation of drugs. So we need to charge these prices to make all this money. Uh, so therefore we can put that money into the next, uh, the next medicines that we look into. Those will presumably, arguably, they will say always be better than the previous ones. Now, one can really unpack that statement, but it's really important to understand that this is this is this is an argument, sloppy as it is, that governments do believe. They really do believe this. And if you want to change uh, governments' thinking, you need to, to persuade them that actually this isn't really uh, a depiction of the truth in a number of ways, uh, which I don't have time to get into. Okay, so what is the the, the, the real truth. Well, first, you know, of course, with that argument, the argument is that leave us alone and the industry will keep on doing what it's doing. And that is good for everyone. Now, a recent article, which I, I shamefully actually discovered it this morning, I was preparing this talk. I think what a sloppy researcher I am to have just found this. But it's written by a chap called Slavik Rola, who's at, uh, um, in, in uh, I think, Frankfurt University, uh, came up two years ago. Where he does it to the study where he shows that a third of global research and development in biomedicine is funded by institutional investors, including pension funds. So, in a way, we are all stakeholders in this industry. Right. So, you know, um, and that, I'll come back to that point a bit, a bit later. Also, there's substantial indirect support in such forms as tax credits. So he actually comes up with a figure of two thirds of the risk capital of biomedical recent development is publicly funded, right? not from industry's own sale. That's really, really important to reflect on, I think. So how does industry actually reduce competition? Because obviously competition will presumably sort of reduce the price, you would think. How does industry do this? Um, I wanna say that, you know, first that in a way we help them we help them a bit too much, right? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so they largely through exclusivities. And these exclusivities are of a number of kinds. So focusing first on intellectual property uh, were patents, which we all know about. So, the, uh, you know, there are lots of patents uh, on protecting an individual medicine. Um, and so, so, so patents is the obvious thing. I don't think we had to discuss that too much, uh, but it's becoming more and more possible. Uh, industry is becoming cleverer and cleverer at you know follow on on patents. So there's talk about you know uh, over 200 patents uh, up to uh, on one particular drug. Uh, I think it's Humira, uh, which is uh, you know that particular one over 200, 200 patents just on. Uh, so when does competition come in? Uh, it, it's going to take quite some time. Um, of course, why does industry patent is not just through competition, it's also about licensing as well. You know, so there is a market in patents. Patents can be bought, sold, um, and licensed too. So, so they are used uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, trademarks. Trademarks, uh, historically, trademarks have, become, have been extremely important, uh, not just on names of drugs, but actually nowadays actually on colors and shapes. And there's a case recently uh, of, a, of AstraZeneca, of all, of all companies, uh, managed to get an injunction to stop a generic uh, firm from India uh, importing into, uh, into um, the United States uh, a medicine, a generic version, which had the same color as the original drug, even though it was off patent. Now, of course, that's a problem because actually it's confusing. It's actually trademarks are being used not to 
uh, to reduce confusion in the marketplace, which is their supposed function, but actually to cause confusion. So they, that, you know, so um, so trademarks are also very, very um, important. They are often overlooked, but they do have a market importance, and there is such thing as trademark evergreening, not just patents. Um, so, and then there is, of course, there is know-how, and know-how is really important in the context of COVID. So even if you have the patents and you can read the patents and you can use them, it doesn't mean you, you actually you then have all the information you require uh, to make a vaccine. Um, so you need to have the know-how uh, as well. And that is protected through, well, trade secrecy law. Right. Uh, fourth is data exclusivity which is provided under 39.3 uh, of the TRIPS agreement. So that can also delay competition. I had a PhD student who's now at Nottingham Trent University called Adam Burek, who wrote a really interesting PhD uh, about how he, showing how sometimes that can also delay competition after the lifetime of any patents. And then that is actually regulatory exclusivities as well. Okay, so the, this is not a free market, it is highly regulated. And the regulatory system also creates exclusivities, ostensibly for good reasons. Right? For example, orphan drugs to encourage uh, industry to invest in rare diseases, for which there isn't, uh, it isn't a market if there were competition. And so uh, orphan drugs uh, uh, laws in Europe and the US can be gamed very cynically by industry. So it's a whole system. Uh, and exclusivities come from a number of different sources. But even without these exclusivities, it does competition immediately spring up. So as soon as the exclusivities, because they're all time limited eventually, when they expire, does it mean you have competition? Not necessarily, because the generic firms won't themselves enter a market if they can't see a profit. And in fact, there was a report by the OECD uh, in Paris, you know, on the competition law and how it applies in uh, in the industry uh, and they say that actually quite a lot of markets in certain certain therapeutic areas there isn't much competition even though uh, there are no exclusivities left so uh, entry markets isn't automatic when exclusivities run out you know you don't don't just assume what will happen there are other ways that uh, there are other ways to deter competition if you're a generic firm, you need to have you need to have a, a, well marketing authorization. To do that, you need to compare your medicine with the original one. If the uh, supply chain of the original drug is completely controlled by one company, uh, then you, you won't be able to get samples that you can use to do the comparative studies. So there are all sorts of, of, of clever tricks of which patents are not just the important, but not the only. Uh, the only one. And of course, there's also the challenge of sourcing of components. And one thing industry is good at is putting putting uh, together the supply abduction chains, uh, which they're very good at doing because they are in the business of production or they license production to somebody else. Uh, and these, so they source you know, active ingredients from India, from China, other places. Uh, so um, they assemble parts of drugs or medicines, and they know how to do this because they have, they have experience. Okay. And it's hard to, to actually replicate that supply chain. You know, it, it's not necessarily an easy, easy thing, right? Um, so yeah, production can be complicated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, certainly true uh, for biologic drugs, you know, these monoclonal antibodies, which are very, very hard to make and expensive to make your own versions of. So they're always going to be um, uh, entry barriers of some kind, whether it's legal or regulatory. There are other ones as well, which you have to be aware of, I think. OK, so let me talk then a little bit more um, about uh, uh, about COVID. Uh, I have my notes here. I don't number my pages, which is uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> gets me in trouble. <laughs> OK, so um, what do we need now? We need faster production and we need global supply, fast production and global supply. Um, there are certain bottlenecks which we are, we, which we are aware of, I think, you know, um, uh, they're bottlenecks. So, uh, but the more production is outsourced, uh, the more these bottlenecks, these uh, supply drops and, you know, are, are gonna be smoothed out. So we, we do really need 
uh, to have that. The logical approach, of course, is to force the sharing of IP and the know-how uh, as well, um, or incentivize in some way or another. And of course, we have incentivized the rapid development. Why? Because of the, of the taxpayers' money and the fact that we are mitigating quite a lot of the risk because the advanced supporters contracts uh, have a certain amounts. Of course, the problem with these amounts is that we are hogging the supply in this part of the world, which is completely uh, wrong. But if there were a, a, a percentage that would be put into a global system, which we have in theory, well, we do have it, but it's not really working as it should, uh, then that would in some part be alleviated. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, we say industry won't share its, its know-how. Um, there was a previous uh, a health crisis uh, in the Second World War. Um, injured soldiers and injured people, injured by bombings and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and penicillin was under development. Uh, it was first developed in the UK, but we didn't know how to, to mass produce it. So we shared the technology with the United States. Uh, they did mass produce it. And um, uh, the US government banged together necessary heads in industry and made them share their, their, their technology, share their know-how, and actually did that. And in a very short time, the US became uh, a producer of 90% of all the person in the world. They, they, they scaled up very fast through sharing knowledge, uh, uh, sharing technology. Uh, and actually in this particular case, the US did not hold the world to ransom. In fact, penicillin was so cheap, it wasn't it wasn't uh, worthwhile for any country to actually make the stuff. You could just it was its cost was nothing, uh, at least for a while. Right. Uh, but then because industry learned through this process, they got better at making antibiotics. And of course, then that's where the money starts to come in afterwards. But not really the pencil, which was not patented anyway, because uh, it, it was uh, it was not novel. Okay, so in a sense, you know, um, IP is in a way the easy part, you might think. Why? Because these are state granted rights that, that, that we give these rights or the right to give on our behalf. And what we give, we should be able to take away or to limit in some way or another. Why we don't do that, that's politics. But, but logically, it is that should be the easy part, right? The, the easy part. Um, United States didn't use patents. They could have done on the, on the process of manufacturing uh, in 1944-45. Uh, they, they didn't actually do that. They shared it. Um, so um, th there, it's been done before. We can do this again. It's not some, but you know, the lazy kind of uh, rhetoric of industry and the, the, the uh, appalling sort of responses to the, the, the waiver proposal which is just lazy, sloppy argument. We shouldn't really convince anybody, but it obviously it does work. It, it, it does work, unfortunately. Okay. All right, so I, I'll finish in, uh, shortly. I'm sure you've had enough of me, but um, um, so yeah, for COVID, we are already paying so much. Um, and yeah, but is the quid pro quo in the global interest? Uh, no, uh, but I think actually, um, you know, Global, co global co cooperation is, is the thing. Uh, we're paying a lot of money, us taxpayers here, um, but we have an interest in the whole world actually getting the vaccines. So uh, we, we, you know, there's, you know, we ha we're paying. And of course, the whole, th the whole thing here is that as I explained about why, how the industry gets money, so much of it comes from us. And yet we're not entitled to have any say at all. Right. This is completely, utterly wrong. This is something that we do need to fight. I think actually I, I was going to be the, the unemotional one and just talk about this stuff. Now I'm getting a little bit excited. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, I can't help it. OK, so it's often said that vaccines are not that interesting in industry. You know? And historically, it's often been the case that vaccines aren't that interesting. Well, now it is very interesting. Uh, and of course, the industry now stands uh, to gain huge amounts of money, um, perhaps less uh, AstraZeneca. Now, what's interesting here is that AstraZeneca has talked about doing you know, non-profit, and certainly one can be cynical, but I think they probably do stand to get less money than, say, Pfizer, who are much more hard-nosed, if that's hard to believe, actually. 
In fact, I've, let me just take that back. AstraZeneca are, are as harmless as anybody, uh, but they have uh, you know, made a, a verbal commitment to not making a profit as long as the emergency, uh, which is at least something, right? And yet it sounds like, you know, from what my impression is that AstraZeneca has been hit quite hard in terms of you know, the investors. You know, the investors now want to put their money, in, they, they want to put our money, I mean, to Pfizer and not into AstraZeneca. So, you know, this, this lack of, of, of having a say here um, is sending all the wrong signals. Okay, well, you know, I do want my pension. I'm getting old now. I do want my pension to, to be pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, I also want to have a clear conscience. And of course, you know, divestment from you know, fossil fuel industries is now a movement. And not say we should divest from the fossil fuel industry. What we, we should do is reward and punish for good behavior. So we want those who make investment choices to actually say, well, this company uh, is doing a poor job in terms of actual access. Uh, therefore, we, we take our money to a company that may be trying to do a better job. I mean, some some do do better jobs than others. There is a sort of a, there is this kind of um, there is a league table, I think. Of, of, of company. I'm not quite sure how good that lead table is, how reliable it is, but certainly some companies do do better than others in certain things. So there is reward, punish, you know, there's discipline one can do, and nothing actually disciplines better than money, right? Uh, which we can move around to where we want it to, to go. Okay, so um, <coughs> I could. I could talk for ages, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. So um, just to say, you know, we do need to do better. We can do better. And there'll be more pandemics to come. Uh, and this, if this is a trial run for, for, for the next one, I have to say uh, we, we need to mark ourselves quite low here. Um, certainly in terms of developing the vaccines, that's been impressive. I must say it's been very, very good. Uh, but in terms of... Um, of, of balancing uh, interest in making money. And it, they're a company, they're private. Of course, they want to make money. Well, public, you know, so company, but they want to make money. I don't, I don't begrudge them making money. Uh, but we're, we're, we're balancing uh, this all wrong with global health. And why do we do this? Because we've actually, uh, the incentive system is so misaligned. Um, it's not just about IP, not just about law, but the whole sort of regulatory system. This industry is so regulated and we misregulate it and that needs to change. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dudfield. That was such an insightful talk. And I think something that was really interesting that he said was that if two thirds of drug manufacturing is funded through our taxes, our money, the public's money, then we're important stakeholders in this whole process as well. And so it's our responsibility to campaign about this as well. And I think that was so interesting. Um, so up next, we have Ms. Rachel Hoare, who is a senior global policy and advocacy officer at the Wellcome Trust. Since August, her role has focused on global access to COVID-19 vaccines. And previously, she worked at Results UK, focusing on tuberculosis. And before that, the MSF Access Campaign. She's also worked at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and has a deep understanding of COVAX. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, oh. Right, sorry, I was just getting the screen up. Um, hi, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, it's yeah, a pleasure to be here. Um, if you could just put the move on to the first slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to start with a very quick overview of what Welcome is. Um, it's a politically and financially independent charitable foundation uh, which uses its endowment fund discovery research um, into health, focusing on three priority areas, mental infectious disease and climate and health. So it funds scientists and researchers in over 70 countries. In response to COVID, this has included funding for research and development into new vaccines, tests and treatments, as well as into genomic surveillance. Um, Welcome also has a policy and advocacy function, which is where I sit. Um, and in COVID, this has included um, advocacy around, for example, resource mobilization. So pushing for funding commitments for the ACT Accelerator, which is a global collaboration between governments, scientists, business, civil society, philanthropy, um, and the global health organizations 
to address the pandemic by supporting development and also equitable distribution of um, tests, treatments and vaccines. And it's achieved quite a lot in the, the, the last year, this, this collaboration. Um, for example, it's on track to deliver 2 billion vaccine doses. Um, and currently it's already reached over 100 countries. Um, it's identified and validated rapid diagnostic tests and helped reduce their cost. Um, it's identified treatments, so dexamethasone, um, and procured over $500 million of PPE. Um, today, I'm going to focus on COVAX, which is the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator. So it's a bit jargon city. <laughs> um, and it's so this this particular pillar. Oh, sorry, if you could move this slide on, please. Um, this pillar has been convened by organizations uh, CEPI, Gavi, WHO, and also working together with UNICEF, World Bank, civil society and, and drug, um, vaccine manufacturers. So what it's sort of aimed to do is um, share the risk. So sharing risk for countries concerned about securing access to vaccines, as well as um, the risk for manufacturers um, who are concerned about um, investing without any assured demand. Um, so try to it, it aimed to accelerate the development and manufacture of vaccines. Um, it's been building manufacturing capacity and buying up supply ahead of time um, before the vaccines were sort of developed and ready to go. Um, and CEPI has been the one leading on investing in particular vaccine candidates um, and continues to, to do so um, with an eye towards vaccines for new, new variants. Um, it also aims to guarantee equitable access to the, to the vaccines around the world. So the World Health Organization led on the development of a fair allocation framework, which outlines which group should be prioritized for vaccination first. So older people, healthcare workers, and um, people with underlying health conditions. And that's, that's the sort of framework that national governments were supposed to base their own rollout plans on. Gavi has led on making agreements with um, vaccine manufacturers which it has successfully done with AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Novavax, Johnson & Johnson, um, GSK in partnership. Um, and that's the two billion doses I was talking about that they have um, hopefully secured for this year. And that amount of doses should be enough to cover about at least 20% of populations in all 190 or so countries that, cope, that are part of COVAX. And according to WHO, 20% of a national population should cover the most vulnerable people. Um, so one other way it works is that any country can participate and, and higher income countries participate as self-financing countries. So they buy their vaccines, but do it through this pooled sort of procurement system. Um, and other countries, 92 countries are eligible for subsidized doses um, through what's called the advanced market commitment. Um, next slide, please. So while COVAX is a, a, a new and kind of quite unprecedented partnership and it's achieved a lot, it's delivered um, vaccines now to 100 countries. And this has come about just 42 days after it delivered to the first country, Ghana. Um, and it's been celebrated that this has happened 12 weeks. So vaccines in COVAX countries came 12 weeks after the first introductions in high income countries. So you might remember here, it was Margaret Keenan being the first to be vaccinated back in, on the 8th of December. And the first COVAX delivery was on 24th of February. Um, but obviously there is a big, there is a gap there and COVAX's efforts have been severely undermined by um, national, uh, sorry, bilateral deals by different countries. So I'm sure everybody's read a lot um, about how unfair the, the distribution has been in the news. So just stepping back slightly from what COVAX has achieved um, and looking at the bigger picture. So as Arisma um, sort of mentioned in the beginning, 
Um, the latest figures from WHO are that 700 million vaccines have been administered globally. Over 87% of these have gone to high income or upper middle income countries, while low income countries have received just 0.2% of doses. Um, so that equates to about one in four people in high income countries having a COVID vaccine, whereas in low income countries, this is one in over 500 people have received a COVID vaccine. Um, so next slide, please. So to sort of address, to try and fix the issues that cause such big access gaps, there's obviously a need for, for long term systemic changes um, so that we would be in a different position in the next pandemic. So things like scaling up manufacturing capacity and um, national regulatory capacity and regional capacity, that sort of thing. But I know the next speakers, Anna and uh, Moga, will be talking about these sort of um, more systemic changes that need to happen. So I'm just going to focus on our at welcome, our two sort of immediate priorities for addressing the access gaps um, in the quickest way possible for COVID access. So the first one is around fully funding COVAX. So it still has quite a big funding gap um, that it needs to fill if it wants to, if it, if it, so that it can deliver on its 2 billion dose promise for this year. Um, and the second ask around dose sharing. So asking governments with a lot of, um, access to a lot of vaccines to start sharing them with COVAX so that they can be um, redistributed more equitably with um, other countries. And I think for everybody, this, there is a clear kind of moral case to, to do this, but there's also a lot of um, public health, scientific and economic arguments too to support this ask. Um, for example, a recent study showed that if the first 2 billion doses of vaccines of an 80% effective vaccines were distributed equitably, six out of 10 deaths could be prevented. But if the doses were monopolized by just 50 countries, only about half as many deaths would be averted. Um, secondly, from the sort of self-interested perspective of high income countries, we know that new strains of the virus um, can emerge and um, we've already seen that some of the existing vaccines are less effective against certain new variants of concern. So vaccinating a lot of people in a small number of countries and leaving high levels of the virus circulating elsewhere could lead to, to new variants that evade the existing vaccines. And even from an economic perspective, um, the economy could con contract by $9.2 trillion this year, about 7% of global GDP, um, if global uh, vaccine, vaccine distribution isn't coordinated at the global level and high income countries, even if they've rolled out um, vaccines for their, their national populations, um, their economies will be hit by, and not, by not taking a global approach. and. Um, a study estimates that they could lose up to 4% of their GDP by the end of this year. So finally, just to say that the, the, the potential number of doses is, is huge for, um, that could be shared. So the, the, the countries listed in this table, this study was the one campaign. Um, and if these, these countries um, donated all their surplus doses, of just the five leading candidates, so AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J, and Novavax. Even if they've vaccinated their entire populations, including children, they have over a billion spare doses still. So the potential is, is very big for, for sharing doses and we're pushing for countries to start sharing in parallel to their national vaccination campaigns rather than waiting until they've, they've covered everybody. Um, so yes, I think I'll stop there knowing that the other speakers will be um, talking about the more systemic changes that are required. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was really interesting, especially the bit at the end where uh, we kind of learned that there's billions of doses in excess and if 
better off countries could just start donating that earlier on. We could perhaps vaccinate people from low income countries much faster and much more effectively. So um, next up, we'll be talking, uh, Miss Anna Marriott will be talking and she is the health policy advisor for Oxfam GB and policy lead for the People's Vaccine Alliance, which is a growing international movement urging that COVID-19 vaccines be made available for all people in all countries free of charge. Anna has also previously led Oxfam's work on universal health coverage. We're so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I should just say I'm co-policy lead for the People's Vaccine and Moga Kamalyani will follow me today um, to talk in more detail about some of the, the solutions that we're seeking um, as the People's Vaccine Alliance. Um, and, and just before I start, I think it's, it's really important um, for us to remember and to emphasize what an important time in history we are in. Lots of people make comparisons um, to the struggle we're facing now, to the struggle for HIV treatment um, 20 years ago. And I think those comparisons are incredibly real and incredibly important. What's different about this moment is that every single person on the planet stands to gain from a change, a systemic change um, in, in the medicines model. And it's a moment um, I think we must push for change in order to both end this pandemic, um, but also unlock some very real solutions for the ongoing um, struggle to access affordable medicines in, in developing countries. And I truly believe it's a moment that we can win that change. Um, but we know that the vested interests are absolutely enormous. Um, and will not win if we don't come together um, and stand together in, in calling for, for this change. So I just wanted to say that because I really welcome everybody's interest in this topic today. Um, and I also really want to urge everyone to stand up and be counted um, in this struggle to make sure that we do achieve the, the, the change that we, we absolutely must see um, in the context of this pandemic. So as we all know, and as lots of people have already said, we have a massive problem. Not enough COVID vaccines are being made. I know the one figures suggest that we are in a good place in terms of the overall volume, but we, we actually are seeing supply problems um, hit rich countries too. Um, and, and we know production delays um, are continuing for many countries. So we do have a significant supply problem right now. Um, and as has already been said, the majority of, of that supply and the supply for the year ahead has been brought up by, by rich nations. And rich nations making up just 16% of the global population have brought up around half of the supply available. There, there's lots of, lots of stats um, around uh, one of those that the People's Vaccine Alliance calculated is that on average in rich countries, people are being um, vaccinated at a rate of one person per second. Um, in the UK, that's around eight people per second. Um, but that's the average rate across um, rich nations. And in contrast, in the majority of developing countries, our, our calculations suggest that nine in 10 people are set to miss out on a COVID vaccine this year. Um, and the majority of those countries are yet to administer a single dose. And while COVAX is aiming for 20% coverage um, by the end of this year, A, it's certainly not ambitious enough. No rich country would, would accept 20% coverage um, by the end of this year. So why should any poor country accept that level of or low level of ambition? But secondly, COVAX is also being hit by these supply problems in, in, in real time now. Uh, and we know that the, the problems with the AstraZeneca vaccine, the uh, export restrictions by India, but more fundamentally, the, the um, over-reliance on just a handful of pharmaceutical corporations who cannot produce enough um, is putting COVAX's 20% target at extreme risk as well. Um, so the overall situation is very much vaccine apartheid, and I don't use that term lightly. It really is um, 
uh, abhorrent inequality in access that, that, that developing countries are facing right now. And I think it's really important to stress that we wouldn't have to be facing um, this situation of, of choice or competition between protecting people in countries like the UK and protecting people in Pakistan, South Africa, Bolivia, if world leaders had acted earlier at the onset of this pandemic to put conditions on their public financing to ensure that the vaccine know-how and technology was shared as a global public good, was transferred to more manufacturers around the world um, so that we could have increased the production. We're, we're, we're not saying that opportunity is over, governments have to act now, but my goodness, we would have been in a different situation had they behaved in the right way and put those that rhetoric around the vaccine being a global public good into action from the first place, um, instead of waiting now to see the, the appalling inequality that we're facing um, and, and um, delaying and delaying the right type of action to take. So the problem really does stem from our collective dependence on just a handful of pharmaceutical corporations. And despite over $100 billion um, dollars of public money that went into the research and development for the COVID vaccines, the pharmaceutical corporations are keeping the vaccine science and know-how under lock and key. They are directly restricting the greater production of these vaccines by other manufacturers around the world. Um, who could make them? They have all the power to decide how much vaccine gets made, who it's sold to and at what price. They, all, they have therefore all the power to decide who lives and who dies. And so that, you know, and they're putting at every step their profits um, before people um, and, and ensuring that they can maximise those profits from this publicly funded science. And rich countries hand in hand with Big Pharma are blocking the solutions called for by the People's Vaccine Alliance and by multiple campaigns um, for a, a vaccine that is freely and fairly available across, across the planet. And, and we at the People's Vaccine Alliance are calling for um, two solutions. The first is uh, the proposal by South Africa and India that the intellectual property rules are temporarily waived or suspended at the World Trade Organization until the world has reached herd immunity. This would remove all the legal barriers for countries to produce or import um, uh, vaccines produced by other countries um, for, to meet their domestic needs. Now, shamefully, Big Pharma and rich countries are continuing to block this proposal. Although I have to say, um, and this is perhaps naive optimism, but we are hearing some more positive noises from the White House that the Biden administration is beginning to contemplate um, this proposal, which in itself, hearing this noise in itself is unheard of. Um, so it's a very exciting development, but, but we're certainly not um, um, anywhere close to victory um, as things stand. So this is exciting, but we need to see all rich countries shift, including uh, the US, to the right side of history and to waive intellectual property in the face of this crisis. The second solution um, that's on the table and that, that the People's Vaccine Alliance is calling for is more support um, for the WHO's COVID Technology Access Pool or CTAP. Uh, Moga can will talk more about this, but this is the place, um, the multilateral space where big pharma or all pharmaceutical corporations and research institutions can share the vaccine technology and science so that it can be transferred to those manufacturers. And this is really critical. Without the know-how and the technology, vaccine production is incredibly difficult, if, if in some cases impossible. Um, so we, we need those both solutions, and that's why the People's Vaccine Alliance is calling for both the IP um, or the waiver, the TRIPS waiver at the WTO, but also critically this, this support for CTAP. But again, despite um, much support from developing countries, 
rich countries continue to stand on the sidelines of CTAP, um, particularly the critical rich countries that, are, that house the big pharmaceutical corporations like the UK and the US. And as yet, not one pharmaceutical corporation has stepped forward to join the pool. So we also know, and, and previous speakers have mentioned this, that, that opposition from rich countries to support these necessary solutions is not only morally wrong, it is totally self-defeating. And, and I think everybody understands that all governments you know, have a primary responsibility to put the health and safety of, of their own citizens first. Um, and, that, and that has to be their priority. But we know that to protect people within their borders, governments also have to act to protect people outside of their borders. That's the nature um, of, of, of this pandemic, the nature of this virus. And a survey um, that the People's Vaccine Alliance conducted a few weeks back um, of epidemiologists across, across the world found that two thirds of those epidemiologists believe we have one year or less before the vaccines that we have now become ineffective because of virus mutations. And that means all the money, um, all the effort into the vaccine rollout so far in countries like the UK, all the lockdowns or the healthcare that has been put on pause in order to respond to COVID will be lost as we you know, uh, rewind time, we go back to zero in the fight against this pandemic. Until we've reached that critical global herd immunity, everyone remains at risk um, from those mutations from this virus. But as um, the previous speaker also said, it's also self-defeating in economic terms. Vaccine inequality will cost the global economy $9 trillion, half of this in rich countries. And because we have that interconnected economy, it will have a very real impact on the UK economy in terms of its trade, in terms of supply chains and manufacturing of, of the goods in imports and exports. And we've looked at these figures and we've, we've looked at the direct estimated impact on the UK economy. And in real terms, um, if we look at the proportion of GDP made up by household income, we know that this economic cost will translate to a very real terms loss for individuals, for you and me, of around £1,000 in the, ne in the next year. So we will all remain at risk and our pockets will all be a lot lighter uh, because of big pharma greed and the refusal of rich countries to remove the artificial barriers preventing a scale up in vaccine production. So what can we do? Well, I would invite you to join the People's Vaccine movement. The People's Vaccine is a vaccine that is available to everyone free of charge, distributed according to greatest need and definitely not ability to pay. It's a vaccine that is not privately owned, but a global public good with the science and technology shared and investments made to maximise production so that we have enough to meet global need as soon as possible. We need to make use of existing manufacturing, especially in developing countries, but we also need to invest in more manufacturing, especially in developing countries, to meet that uh, global vaccine demand now, but also to meet needs for the future, future pandemics, but also ongoing health needs to help redress that inequality in access to medicines and vaccines. So the People's Vaccine Alliance um, is, is a movement of over 50 organisations across the world and it really is growing day by day. The movement is backed by key figures from the current president and prime ministers of South Africa and Pakistan to former leaders such as Gordon Brown and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, leading economists including Mazakatu and Stiglitz, um, religious figures like the Archbishop of Cape Town and current very influential politicians like Bernie Sanders. We're acting in many different countries, um, particularly those rich countries um, that hold the power over the pharmaceutical corporations in the US, in Europe and, and in the UK. But we also have a gr growing um, um, alliance in Asia, in Africa and, and Latin America as well. And our movement really is having impact. We've really helped put global vaccine inequality into the mainstream media. 
on a weekly basis, finding new ways and new voices to tell the story of why we need action. And journalists are now asking power holders the right questions. We've mobilized over 1 million people to join the call for a people's vaccine, demanding that rich countries back the WTO waiver proposal. And this number is, is rapidly growing as we speak, thanks to the support of, of celebrities like George Clooney, Annie Lennox and, and Lily Cole. And we've seen, you know, we've helped mobilize people around the world for two global days of action, one before Christmas, uh, one a few weeks ago, calling for the CEOs of big pharma corporations um, to ask them to share, share the vaccine know-how and technology, literally calling, we've had people calling uh, the pharmaceutical corporations, leaving messages for CEOs um, to say why, why are they keeping the, the science and technology under lock and key. We've um, had um, amazing, exciting um, public action around the world on those global days of action, including uh, people putting people's vaccine projections up on, on the walls of pharmaceutical uh, corporation buildings. We've hosted online rallies with speeches from key global figures and we've been very active all over social media, mobilizing people in their thousands to target pharmaceutical corporations and governments, um, asking them to, to step over to the right side of history and, and make the changes that we need to see. And I'll just uh, finish by saying we have got much more coming up. We've got important events ahead of us here in the UK, the G7, um, will be such a critical moment uh, to hold the UK government's feet to the fire, but all G7 nations. Um, and, and we urge everyone to get involved in, in helping us do that. Um, we know that the UK remains a very vehement blocker to the WTO TRIPS waiver, and we need to work together to increase the pressure on them to embarrass them for their failure to provide any global leadership on this issue. But more urgently, we have an upcoming Global Week of Action um, on the week of the 19th of April um, that coincides with the next World Trade Organization meeting, um, but also the shareholder meetings of the big pharmaceutical corporations like Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca. Um, and we need all the help we can get to join in with the activities that we have um, planned. And we'd love as many of you to join in um, and encourage others to join in um, on that week of action. Um, if, you, if you would like to, to um, get more information about that, if you go to the peoplesvaccine.org web, web page and click on the Take Action page, um, you'll see that there's a list of current activities that you can do right now, um, particularly on social media, targeting pharma, targeting governments as well. But but shortly we will also be posting all the ways in which you can engage on that global week of action on the 19th of, uh, from the 19th of April as well. So I will finish there. Um, I will hand over to Moga to talk in more detail about those um, issues that we're, that we're working on um, and just encourage you all to, to join with us um, and do all that you can to hold the power holders feet to the fire right now and, and push for that change. Um, push for a people's vaccine, not a profit vaccine. Thanks ever so much. Thank you, Miss Marriott. That, that was really interesting. And we've learned so much from your talk, especially about how it's so important for us to have a people's vaccine, not just because it's ethically wrong, but also because it's going to cost the global economy $9 trillion. And at the end of the day, it's going to go back on all the healthcare advancements we've made. Um, so, as Ms. Marriott mentioned in her talk, uh, she was mentioning a few links about how to get involved with the people's vaccine movement. And those links can be found in the chat box right now. Um, so next, we're going to have Dr. Moga Kamalyani talk to us. So Dr. Moga Kamalyani has over 40 years of experience in global health and health policy, particularly concerning developing countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Since starting as a GP in Egypt, um, Moga has worked with international agencies, national NGOs, and governments all over the world. She's worked for Oxfam for 24 years as a program and senior health policy advisor, and is currently a key advisor to UnitAid, Oxfam US, and the People's Vaccine Alliance. 
Currently, she has been providing regular information on COVID-19 in Arabic on Twitter and through podcasts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I don't just say that I don't actually uh, work for Oxfam US. Um, I work with them as part of my work uh, with the People's Ally Vaccine Alliance. Uh, but thank you for the introduction. And it's a really difficult task for me now coming after all these wonderful speakers who covered a lot of the important issues. So um, I'm going to tell you like, to, to, to talk like a story because uh, that's kind of uh, my background culture. And take you to, the, uh, um, to what, what we learn or what I personally learned through this COVID uh, uh, saga really. So um, I've got five lessons that I, that I learned that cover some of the issues that Anna wanted me to talk about or, or you wanted me to talk about. Uh, so let, let's start. If you remember, cast your, your, your uh, memory back with the whole, lot, whole saga started, like, you know, February, March, uh, April even. Um, so the, the WHO said it's uh, uh, in January, in the end of January, they said this is a public health um, uh, problem of international concern. What did Europe and the US, basically rich country, do? Ignored it, except Germany and some of the Scandinavians uh, and the other northern, Europe, northern European countries, they took it serious. The rest ignored it. And they kept saying, you know, it's a Chinese thing. Well, of course, in China, they could do lockdown. We don't do it here because, of course, people value their freedom. We can't do lockdown here. Um, and then they suddenly, the, they realized that it's a big, a big problem, that it's affecting everything and they have to do lockdown and the economy is affected. And they looked at the way out. And of course, we need the magic way out, which is a vaccine. And if you remember, the start of, of um, investment was about treatment, not vaccines, because they thought vaccines will take 10 years to develop, because that's what pharmaceutical companies say. So when they started talking about vaccines, we come to the first lesson. Um, it's about how do I protect my people? And in, particularly in the UK here, we heard a lot about, we listen to the science, we do the science as if there's something called the science. Um, and of course, if they'd listened to the science, they would have looked at the global public health, what the issues that uh, uh, and, and Marit and, and Graham and, and, um, talked about, that you, know, that you can't, the virus doesn't need a passport, doesn't need a visa to come here. Um, so, so, so they focused on me, me, me and ignore the rest. Um, the second thing is, which I, I still find is really incredible is, is kind of this taken by surprise. So um, last month or maybe a couple of months ago, you could see that, that is the problem in the, in the EU about, oh my God, we don't have enough vaccines. <gasps> AstraZeneca decided to, to decrease the amount, so did Pfizer, by the way, uh, decrease the number of doses that they were going to deliver by month X and month Y. And that was really a surprise. While anybody who had just two grains of brain would have expected that last year, that we would need vaccine, the whole world would need vaccine. So how many people are in the whole world? Therefore, how many doses we will need? Therefore, how do we get these doses? And that simple kind of thinking, way of thinking wasn't thought about because, because uh, it's me too. So let me secure the biggest number of vaccines, that, doses that I can. And also because Companies say, I can produce 2 billion doses. Well, okay, they can produce 2 billion doses, so why should you worry? Companies said, you know, the UK had uh, um, secured an agreement, a deal with AstraZeneca to provide 100 million doses. Europe did the same for 300 million doses. So they sat down and said, well, the 300 million doses will come. Will they come overnight? 
Will they come next week? Will they come in the whole January? January and February, the whole year? When will you have the 300 million doses? Even in these countries, not, not, uh, not even, we haven't even talked about, about developing countries yet. So it's this lack of really using the science and understanding that when companies say, you know, you sign agreement for 300 or 100 or whatever number of doses, it doesn't mean you will have it next week. Even if you approve it, you know, it's not once the regulatory approval happen, then production will happen just like by magic, press a button. It doesn't do, it doesn't happen that way. So, so this, this kind of surprise is, is, well, I don't know. I think it's criminal really from politicians and the relying on companies. So that is a surprise and reliance on what company says last year. Okay, maybe last year was, uh, you know, everything was new. Now we are in 2001. It's more than a year since we had uh, since it was announced as a global pandemic. Um, so think, so the, the thinking of how to pro provide the vaccine should move, but it hasn't. So um, the second lesson that we have is this thing about supply. This is the big elephant of the, in, in the room. See, try to see how many politicians in Northern countries, in, in Western countries or in rich countries, whatever you call them, how many politicians say there is a problem of supply? There is a problem in shortages of doses and therefore we need to do something about it. They don't because that means it's a responsibility to do something that is not relying on companies. So whenever there's a little bit about, oh, we might have delays in the NHS or, or a problem in Europe, what you hear is Pfizer says they're going to, um, uh, produce more vaccines and uh, you get numbers, billions of doses. They increase their production of, or their, um, uh, like their intention to produce more, I don't know, instead of 1 billion, it becomes 1.5 or 2 billion or whatever. I lost touch with all the billions that they're going to produce. Um, and they had a little agreement, one agreement was one company in, I don't know, Belgium or something. So that company will produce the billions when? And for whom? So basically, the, 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 the government everywhere really, but especially in the in rich countries, they were happy or content at least, that they are still content to leave fundamental decisions in the hands of pharmaceutical companies. The, deci the decision on production and therefore supply, the decision on allocation and the decision on price. So production, we talked about a little bit, um, allocation. So assuming that, let's take AstraZeneca, assuming that AstraZeneca is not going to produce logically 100 million doses or 200 million doses in a week. Let's say they produce a million doses a week. Let's, let's, let's say they produce 100 million doses a week, just top of our heads. How now they have a contract with the UK, they have a contract with Canada, with the, U, with the US, with the EU, and with COVAX. How is it going to decide to give 5 million doses to, I don't know, Japan and 10 to whatever, and 5 to whatever, and 20 to COVAX? How they get, who decides that? It's AstraZeneca that decides. How they decide it? It's their commercial secret. We don't know. So a vital decision like who gets what, when is in the hands of pharma totally. And then of course the price. And particularly in the UK, when we haven't got a clue what price we're paying in, 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 in any of these vaccines, not just AstraZeneca. So uh, even COVAX with due, with due respect, um, they, 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 COVAX keep saying that they have the, the most, um, uh, how did you say it, Rachel? Um, like the biggest profile of vaccines. Where? They have it, yes, they secured uh, agreements, but if when Johnson & Johnson produce the vaccines, will they prioritize the UK or COVAX? What does COVAX have now? AstraZeneca. 
relying almost, almost exclusively on the Serum Institute in India. And this bilateral deal, we can't do this because it's a commercial secret, we just discovered bits and pieces about it. The other day, when was it? Was it about 10 days ago or kind of a week ago? <laughs> I was listening, I was in bed listening to today program and I jumped, I wanted to break something. I really was so angry. Thank God there was nobody in the house. Um, when it's in total innocence, they were just saying this piece of news innocently as if it's normal that uh, the NHS may find some may, may uh, face some delays in vaccination in April because there's delay in five million doses coming from the Serum Institute in India. And like two days before that, Boris, Matt Hancock are kind of like saying how wonderful the UK is contributing to the world and how wonderful pharmaceutical companies are contributing. Look at AstraZeneca uh, deal with India. So as if that deal with India is for developing countries. In fact, we discover that the deal has closed that says uh, that AstraZeneca, it takes priority on serum production. And of course, it seems that the deal between AstraZeneca and the UK says that UK takes priority. Therefore, as, um, serum pr uh, uh, production, uh, uh, the UK has a priority. I mean, where, where, I mean, so, so don't tell me that um, this, the, agree, the bilateral agreement with Serum is for developing countries. Actually, we have 5 million doses that were taken from African nurses. That's how I see it personally. Um, so, so, so COVAX is, is, is in trouble now because they, we don't know when, the vaccine, when they will have uh, uh, more doses from um, AstraZeneca because of the, from Serum, because of the total reliance on the one company and the one company's agreement with somebody else. So, so that's, that's the problem about supply. Now, um, there is a solution. If you think that you want to get or supply to everybody, then you need to maximize the global capacity of production. That's what you need to do. So you need to enable all potentially capable companies to produce this, this vaccine. WHO looked at that last April, so a year ago. So all, you know, almost a month after, actually not, not even a whole month, after they, they thought about, they said it's a global pandemic, they, uh, with, with 40 countries, set up what Anna mentioned, the COVID-19 technology access pool. This, this mechanism or this initiative is based on something called the medicine patent pool, and some of you perhaps will know it, which was um, developed in United actually as a way of having coordinated licenses, so that's a voluntary license from companies. So the com it's like a one-stop shop. So the company that has intellectual property and technology license their intellectual property and their technology to the pool. The pool sub license to as many companies as possible. And when you say many, that means supply and low price, because many means uh, competition, so price goes down, and also means everybody can produce 10, 20, 30, 40. Collectively, you have the supply you need. And that's what we have with HIV medicines uh, at the moment, and also with TB. Um, and they opened it even for um, COVID medicines, except we, we, we don't have treatment yet. So based on that model, the WHO set up the technology access pool. Um, in the vaccine store, in, in the medicine patent pool, the issue was more on price, because you were talking about chemical molecules, kind of generic companies can, can reproduce them. Um, with the vaccine, you would need a, lo a, lo a, a bit or lot, depends really, of technology transfer or of access to technology. 
So the idea also is that the, the, the companies allow this access to technology, given that, as Graham said, we paid for that technology. So they don't, it's not a private property, actually. It is a private property by intellectual property rights, through intellectual property rights. But in reality, who paid for it is actually public, um, public property. Um, so so the, the poll was there and not one single country supported it. Not one single Northern country, a rich country supported it, apart from Norway and Netherlands, basically the countries that don't have strong pharmaceutical industry. So the UK, the US, Canada, uh, uh, Germany, France, they don't support it. More, of, more than that, not one single company actually talks about it even, except rubbishing it. So they say it's nonsense, or what you hear is intellectual property is not an issue. And in vaccines, they say in vaccines, intellectual, and they say it with great uh, confidence. So you hear that from Gavi, you hear it from Sepi, you hear it from Covax, basically, from um, uh, all the all the organizations that have heavy support from Bill Gates. They say intellectual property is not an issue, and of course from uh, the UK and all rich uh, countries. Well, if it's not an issue, why is Moderna have 12 patents on their vaccine? This is just one example. And of course, intellectual property is not just patents. Intellectual property covered trade secrets, which is like the data that you have to rely on to, to approve a, a, a medicine, the know-how, a lot of the technological issues are, in, are protected by intellectual property, it's not just patents. Anyway, so, um, so we have this mechanism in WHO and it's sitting idle because they don't want to use it. Um, so, so that's the, the second thing about the elephant in the room, the supply. And actually the, the way I, in my head, the way I see this supply issue and the me, 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 me issue is like, I saw the vaccine from the beginning as one little pizza and big guys in the room snatching the, the biggest bit, bit they can get and leaving crumbs to others. And that's the crumbs that left for developing countries, whether it's via COVAX or not, it's still the crumbs. Instead, if you, if you really care, you would say, let's maximize the size of the pizza. And guess what? Let's have several pizza so everybody can have a fair share. But that's yeah. not what we have, what, what we, we, what we have at the moment. Um, so the, the, the solution that they're offering, something called the third way at the moment, which is not third way at all, is just a, the old solution of uh, bilateral deals. So pharmaceutical companies just leave them and they will sort it, basically. They're going to produce billions of doses and they're going to do bilateral deals. Oh, look at AstraZeneca and what AstraZeneca is doing. That's what we're seeing with AstraZeneca, that prioritizing the UK over Africa. That's what we're seeing. Starving got, uh, COVAX from doses. That's the bilateral deal. Thank you very much. It's secret. Because commercial is secret, so we don't know what's in it. You just discover things as you go along. What we're asking for is what Dr. Tedros called a coordinated mechanism, like this CTAP, this COVID access pool, where companies put the stuff and leave it for others to sub-license. Um, so, um, that's my, uh, my, my second lesson. My third lesson is about uh, Dr. Again, story, um, the importance of long-term funding of, of R&D. Uh, Graham talks about public funding. And if you listen to Sarah Gilbert, who um, is the Oxford um, scientist who basically invent, invented the, what, called, what is called AstraZeneca vaccine, they started working on it at the time of SARS. So it's, it's good, it's almost 20 years now, or, or 18 years that they were working on it. They actually almost reached a vaccine or reached a vaccine and they put it on the shelf because SARS was merciful than, than, than COVID. Who funded this? It's public funding. The same ways that Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. There was two scientists in the University of Pennsylvania, one of them was Hungarian actually, and 
they were worked for years, good 20 years or 25 years working with mRNA, not necessarily for COVID, for other things. So who funded um, them? They I Dr. Moga Kamalyani, just a minute. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but um, right, we're quickly going to move into the Q&A session. So if you could just wrap up your speech in the next one or two minutes, that would be great. And then perhaps you could mention your other thoughts on this issue through the Q&A as well, because we've got quite a few questions in the chat box. Okay, I'll, I'll take a couple of, so basically, okay, I'll, I'll stop here um, in terms of uh, uh, what's happening now. And the way forward that we have to look for international mechanisms to mechanism not bodies not creating another body for sharing for produce maximizing production and for sharing that don't rely on bilateral deal um i'll just take a so do you want to take the questions now or later yeah so we're just going to kind of close the speeches off now and then i'll read out the questions from the chat and then perhaps all the speakers could chime in and answer okay Okay, so 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 yeah, so that's where we are now. That they, they're offering the bilateral deals as a solution, and we're talking about a multilateral mechanism to to enhance production because that provides security for the future. We can't in developing countries. To now speaking as somebody from a developing country, we just can't rely on be at the mercy of pharmaceutical companies forever. I just want to clear two myths. When you say that, that the UK can donate X number of doses, the UK or Europe is actually a clear example. When President Macron said 5%, they will donate 5%. Well, he doesn't have any percent to donate. Eventually, they will have this, all these millions, they will have them eventually. But at the moment, they don't. He doesn't have enough to vaccinate his people in France. So how do we expect him to donate to others? So donation is plaster. It's not a, re a real solution. It's a plaster solution. What we need is we need a, 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 a biomedical research assistant that uh, put public health as the goal. And therefore you look at how do I finance it? And then, for, and then, then, then after that, pricing it is a separate issue. And the COVID vaccine shows clearly that how to finance it is separated because publicly we did finance the, and that was my second lesson. I will put a link to the, to the five lessons. Okay. Thank Sorry, you so much, so Dr. Long. Moga Kamalyani. <laughs> no, no, it's perfectly fine. That, that was a really interesting perspective on the challenges that we currently still face. And I thought it was very interesting about how Although we spend a lot of our time campaigning against pharmaceutical companies, the issue also lies with the incompetency and over-dependency of governments on these companies. So with that, let's, um, I'm sure a lot of you have put a lot of questions in the chat box and I have seen them, but if you have any further questions, please feel free to. Oh, uh, I think I was muted. Okay, yeah. Uh, so just to go back, I'm not sure what all um, I what all you guys heard, but I just wanted to thank Dr. Moga Kamalyani and about how that was a very interesting perspective on the issues that we currently face. And what I thought was really interesting was about how you know pharmaceutical companies. Obviously, we know that their selfish interests are a huge issue, but another huge issue is the governments' their over dependency on these companies. And we're now going to move into the Q and A session. So I know there are lots of questions in the chat box. If you have any other further questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box now. Um, and to kick off the Q and A session, uh, here's our first question. Uh, someone from the chat asked. Are there any significant barriers to the development of antivirals or has the company Gilead just been very good at creating a niche and a monopoly? I think this was after Professor Dutfield's talk, so probably he could take it. Um, okay, well, yeah, antivirals, yeah. Um, well, um, I think actually Gilead are, are, are very crafty. I think at one point they used for orphan drugs uh, uh, regulations thinking that in, in the number of people who get COVID wouldn't be very many, which we all knew was nonsense by the time that they did that. But then they pulled back a little bit, didn't they? But I mean, you know, um, 
Uh, th there's quite a well-known sort of former uh, a British judge uh, who's, now, who's now at UCL who said, well, the reason why we need patents is, it, is making, making you know, copies is it costs the top of the bucket, you to keep saying, which, of course, is absolute rubbish because actually, you know, um, there are upfront costs and these things are not very, you know, easy to make. Antivirus are not actually very easy uh, to, actually, to, to actually make. But, of course, you know, this is about, you know, trying to, to repurpose old, uh, you know, old medicines. And, uh, uh, again, the industry says, you know, we, we don't have the incentive to actually investigate old medicines, which I find very hard to actually accept because... Um, you know, they're already presumably safe anyway. So, uh, and they, they can have, have patents on new uses of old drugs. So I find that, that one very hard to actually um, accept. I don't know if that really answers the question, but uh, um, uh, could I also tie it to the question of Swati, because it seems to be so, sort of related uh, about, again, about the AstraZeneca chap talking about, um, you know, it's you know hard to make these things. And what he says, uh, you know, that you know these things quality control is of course it is very very important I, I don't know enough about the technology to say that he's wrong in what he says but I would say it is actually quite convenient for him to say this uh, but again one can find a historical uh, person to say yeah I mean in um, in the 1920s when insulin was patented uh, by the University of Toronto um, and Eli Lilly got one or two patterns as well. And Eli Lilly at that time was a firm that's a bit more sort of gentlemanly than it is now, I have to say. Um, uh, uh, but the purpose of the patents was not actually uh, to charge extortionate prices. The purpose of the patent actually was uh, to make sure that companies or you know, people didn't just make you know, insulin in their in their kitchen or whatever and produce sort of dangerous stuff because you know making it right was really important. So it was. The patenting was used actually not as monopolies to charge high prices. It was used as a monopoly, but yes, but in order to make sure that it was made properly. So it was done for safety reasons. So, you know, again, so patents can be used for a number of different purposes. It's usually used to charge high prices, but patents sometimes, sometimes are, are done in, in the right spirit uh, as it was done then. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that was wrong what they did. And actually, it was probably actually a good thing in that at that time. Anyway, okay, I'll, I'll stop now. Um, yeah, great. I think that answered their questions. Mm. Um, so now we have two other questions that are sort of linked. So one of the questions is about how, with the current political climate, it favors rolling out an extensive COVID vaccination program, especially in countries like the UK. So if the government one, if the public wants to get vaccinated then how can our governments advocate for greater and earlier access of vaccines to LDCs? And another sort of linked question to that that we thought of earlier was that although we're hoping that, um, although we're hoping that the TRIPS waiver would be useful in providing access to technology to other countries that could perhaps produce the, you know, the COVID vaccine for cheaper, um, a lot of people have doubts about whether these countries actually have the infrastructure to produce these vaccines um, at a large scale. So does anyone have any thoughts about that? Would anyone like to go first? I could come in on the first one. Um, and it comes back to my point about, and Moga's point as well, that, um, you know, I think politically it is very difficult for, for, the, for people in the UK to support the donation of, of vaccines before they have been vaccinated themselves or their loved ones. Um, I think that is what makes it incredibly difficult to suggest, I mean, there's many flaws with the, with the idea that donations are gonna solve this, um, but, but that is a very real political constraint for, for countries. And, and that's why we're really at pains to stress that this absolutely shouldn't be a competition between vaccinating people in countries like the UK or vaccinating people in, in developing countries if we fix that supply problem. Now, unfortunately, you know, we could have, if we'd acted in the right way 12 months ago, we wouldn't be in this situation now. We could have shared the science and technology, invested in the additional um, uh, capacity, the quality control, 
etc we would have been in a much better situation to avoid this conflict as it is now we're seeing even rich countries descending into trade wars um, between themselves fighting over this small pie so i think it's really really important that we see these structural solutions like the ip waiver like um the the ctap as sharing the science not sharing the actual vaccines themselves although of course you know be, given the the humanitarian need if donations are made they are incredibly welcome they are incredibly needed but we actually have to fix the supply problem so we're not talking about a competition and that's why you know boris johnson talking about greed and capitalism being being our uh, savior is completely at odds with the evidence and and it's why we have to embarrass him right now that he is standing in the way of ending this pandemic by refusing uh, to back the, the real solutions on the table. Yeah, th thank you so much. Um, so moving on to another question that we had. Um, so recently, Global Justice Now re reported that the EU is paying $2.16 per vaccine dose for the Astra AstraZeneca vaccine, and South Africa is paying $5.25, and Uganda is paying $7. So just generally, how are these companies justifying this difference in prices? And why, why is there such a big difference in the price of just one dose of vaccine? Yeah, I, I can see Dr. Moga Kamaliani is interested in answering. Yeah, just call me Moga. Um, so basically, a company say that, that's what the companies say, and some of it is true, that the price depends on the cost of production and also on the distance and, and all sorts of other things they talk about. Um, AstraZeneca sells to Europe from AstraZeneca factories in Europe. Sierra, AstraZeneca South, sells to South Africa via Serum Institute. So it's different structure of the, uh, how they decide the price. But because the, deal, the fundamental problem is the deal between AstraZeneca and Serum is a bilateral commercial secret deal. Therefore, we don't know what's in that deal. What it seems like is that the deal didn't talk about price. In fact, I would be very surprised if the deal talked about price. Because these are two companies negotiating on the base of what's good for me. It's a commercial deal. What's good for me as a company? The multilateral system, like if you have a, a patent pool, like the medicine patent pool and the HIV story, they negotiate on behalf of public health. That's a totally different way of negotiating. And therefore, it's a totally different way of having a deal. And therefore, you know, Serum says that they don't have any, you know, they sell, they sell whatever is economically valuable for them. And by the way, South Africa doesn't take the, they got rid of all what they bought because of the variant issue. So, um, but, but Uganda paid that. Brazil, Brazil is interesting. Brazil will, is paid from directly AstraZeneca, uh, a low price, I think it's $3 if I remember right. Uh, but from Serum, it would be 5.25. And, and, and AstraZeneca gave them low price, partly, partly because the deal between AstraZeneca and Oxford talked about low price and partly because they have clinical trials in, in Brazil. And again, the Brazilian government or, or the institution that uh, um, negotiated the deal with AstraZeneca insisted on sharing technology and on low price. Thank you so much. That, that was really informative. So um, I know we were supposed to end around now. So I'm just going to end with just one last question. So now that we have a lot of context on what issues we already currently face with regards to COVID vaccine access, I think it's also really important to realize how we as university students can help. So I know Anna has a lot to say about this and she has to talk about getting involved with the People's Vaccine Alliance. But just the last question to end today's session is what role can university students play in making not just the COVID vaccine more accessible, but essential medicines in general. Um, so could we have perhaps uh, Professor Dutchfield and Miss Rachel Hoare talk about that first, and then we can move on to Anna and Moga about the People's Vaccine Alliance.
Um, I thought it was slightly unqualified to answer the question because I think you all do seem to be doing a great job and you've got so much potential here. I, I'm very impressed. I mean, I've been sort of following this about 20 years since, you know, the late 1990s and uh, um, and I've sort of seen activism at work. Uh, um, I haven't much of the time been directly involved. I sort of sign petitions and I write stuff that sometimes people read. Um, but I think you're really doing a, doing a great job. And I think it's important to network actually internationally, uh, make it a global movement, but act nationally as well, because um, um, you have to, you know, you're fighting on, on so many fronts here. Uh, and, and you can't do it by yourself. You do need, I mean, these sorts of events, I think are really good. But you also need to, you know, you know th there's a lot of people out there who feel the same way as you do, you know, um, so reach out, you know, but I think you're doing it anyway. So. Yeah, I think um, encouraging leaders at the, at the university, professors, also to lend their voices to the same asks as CSOs, I think the more diverse the group of um, people putting pressure on the governments, the better. So it's not just the usual suspects of CSOs, but also leading university um, figures, I think is, 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 is very important as well. Uh, can we have Anna and Moga talk as well about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would like fully applaud the work of UAEM in um, bringing together students um, both in the UK but also globally and really encourage people to connect with, with the campaign. There's some fantastic innovative work being done particularly on the public funding side to really bust the myth about um, how much is publicly funded versus private, private um, funding. Um, that pharmaceutical corporations invest at risk, you know, the proportions that we've talked about already. Um, and I, I guess I just, you know, I feel, like I said at the beginning, we are in a moment where we all need to act together, um, whether that's taking action with the people's vaccine, um, whether it's working with the likes of Global Justice Now, UAEM, actually we're all coming together now and it's not about, um, which organization you pick and choose, it's it's a movement um, very akin to the move, the such, you know, the successful movement that was built um, in the HIV access um, struggle. So I just encourage you to reach out to organizations, um, find out what's going on and and join in, sign petitions, get out on get out safely where you're allowed to join in the public actions that are being organized and, and keep a watch on the People's Vaccine website for, for a summary of those activities that really does try to bring together all of the organizations working on this. Um, and please do keep, keep fighting for this, fight with your MP, um, you know, join in on activities um, targeting pharmaceutical corporations. We need voices to be heard now um, and we need everyone involved, but thank you very much. Well, you guys, you, see, you said it all. Um, for, for me, really, and again, learning from the movement of uh, the HIV movement, but also from what's happening now. If you imagine um, a, like a triangle of influence, so you've got to influence government, you've got to influence government, pharmaceutical companies, and the investors in, in the companies. These are really critical people. So in order to, to, to uh, influence that, that big, that triangle, you need this really strong, big ball in the middle, which is this a uh, global public movement, global civil society movement, you know, students, um, the people that Anna mentioned at the beginning as members of the uh, people's vaccine, ev everybody basically, um, to, to, uh, to raise the, pu the public anger. This is not we're sad about poor Africa, so we need a bit of charity there. No, this is anger that 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 more more than half the the world population doesn't have access. That that Africa has less than one percent uh, that receive vaccines uh, that have doses, not even in in their in their arm. This is just makes people should make us all angry, and we turn the anger into positive pressure. On the, on the investors so they know that there's a PR issue here 
for the companies and they do whatever that to pressure the companies and to pressure governments to take actions at the end of the day it is government's action that makes it makes a difference and we need to be very clever in using the media really clever social media you're all on social media you're all young people who are absolutely fantastic with social media but also the traditional media we need to be really clever about using it and I just want to thank you so much for your work and your interest and educate yourself. Be aware of what's going on so you can understand, so you can uh, bust the mess that, that that traditional media nor or social media have uh, from pharmaceutical companies and from governments. Yeah, I definitely agree with what everyone said here today. Those are some very effective ways in which we can get ourselves involved. And if you want to know more ways in which you can get involved, we have a campaign tomorrow that um, I think Aisha and Rebecca and Rachel will be talking about later today. But just before that, I just want to end this plenary first. So I just want to end by um, saying uh, by citing this one thing that Anna said that really stood out to me and that was that pharmaceutical companies have control right now over who lives and who dies and they're making profits from a from something that was publicly funded from publicly funded research and I think that was so interesting and it really stood out to me because if we're funding this vaccine we should you know have the rights to know where it goes and what's happening with it so thank you so much to all of our speakers for taking time out of your busy schedules to talk at this conference. Um, this plenary, I'm sure, has given all of us a lot to think about. And if anyone has any other questions that weren't answered in the plenary, then please put them up on the Padlet wall, which I think the link should be in the chat soon. And they will be answered soon. Along with that, any resources that were mentioned during the plenary will be posted on, posted on the Padlet wall as well, including ways in which you can get involved. I'm now going to hand over to our co-chairs for the conference, Ayesha and Rebecca. So over to you guys. Amazing. Thank you so much, Erisma, for chairing that plenary. And thank you to our panelists for giving us a real great insight into how pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies run, how COVAX, how CTAP and how the TRIPS waivers can be used to encourage equitable distribution of the COVID vaccine. I really enjoyed the ending of our discussion because I think it really does pertain to us and I think it has given us a lot of inspiration of how we can get involved in movements in the future. So before we draw our first day to a close, as mentioned previously, we are going to be hearing from Rachel from KCL UAM, who has been heading our hashtag where's the vaccine uh, campaign. I don't know whether you can see our badges. Um, so thank you very much, Rachel, for joining us and over to you. Great. Um, and can I just say, like, I've never been set up better for what I'm going to say. So thanks to all the speakers. It's been really interesting hearing um, um, about this whole situation and, and what we need to do to, to improve. So um, before I talk any more, I just want to share a quick video that we've made. Um, so let me just play this. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. So yeah, this was the introduction to our um, campaign that we're running alongside this conference, the hashtag Where's the Vaccine campaign. Um, I hope this video gave you a quick sense of what we're trying to achieve. Um, but our aim is to get people signing Global Justice Now's action, which is a ready-made email to the UK government asking them to support the TRIPS waiver that we've heard so much about. Um, and I hope that, yeah, this is this um, plenary has just really highlighted the need for, for alternative um, solutions. 
Um, so you can see on the screen here, there's a QR code. Um, if you um, scan that QR code, it will take you directly to the action that we want people to sign. Um, and I would really appreciate if you took a moment to do that. I think the link's also going to be put in the chat. So in order to um, spread the word about this action, um, we're using social media as a tool, as unfortunately we can't meet in person. Uh, we're running a vaccine plushie giveaway competition on Instagram, which is closing at midnight tonight. Um, so please do check out um, King's UAM's Instagram for that. And we'll be announcing the winner tomorrow at the end of the conference. We're also making TikToks using audio from Free the Vaccine's Jolene parody, um, as you saw in the video. And a few of the TikToks already done were in the video as well. These have had several thousand views between them. So it's really interesting to highlight like different um, social media techniques that we can, um, we still have to discover really. Um, so we're also going to be cooking up a bit of a storm on Twitter tomorrow, so do keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and then our last action will be using everyone here in our conference. So the last plenary will be a workshop getting you to participate in our, in our campaign, either through making your own TikTok or writing your um, own letter to your MP. And then one last thing we'd like to, um, everyone to do before I'll hand back to Aisha and Rebecca is to take a picture with everyone. So if I could ask you all to turn on your videos and then I'll take a screenshot. Um, obviously, if you aren't comfortable with um, having your, your video in the screenshot, just leave it off and um, hopefully we'll have enough people. So if you can stop sharing now, let me unpin myself as well. I don't know if I can... Can I unspotlight myself? Oh yeah, I can. Awesome. Just making my uh, <laughs> little um, symbol in the middle of that. I'll give you a few seconds to turn on your videos. Okay, amazing. Thank you everyone for taking part in this and we're going to post this to our Instagram. So um, thanks a lot. Um, and so now I'm going to hand back to Aisha and Rebecca. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and thanks to everyone who's spoken today um, to all our amazing speakers, um, as well as all our amazing conference team who've made today possible. We're really grateful and we're really glad um, as well to our attendees for coming and joining us. Um, we really do hope to see some of you for our social this evening. It'll be on this same link, so you've already got the link ready, starting at 6 p.m. There'll be a chance to meet your fellow attendees in a more relaxed environment and enjoy some access to medicine themed fun. We've also got an amazing day planned for you tomorrow, for day two, and um, got lots of fun activities, lots more engaging talks and speakers and workshops. And as Rachel mentioned, we've got our campaign training session um, and we're really looking forward to engaging with you all on our campaign and really calling for vaccine equity as we have seen the need for today. So thank you all for joining us um, and we really look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>